Hello. Is this working? Sounds like it is. Thanks, first of all. Thank you, much. Thank you very much, everybody, to choosing this session of all the sessions you could have been watching here. Um, so this session is about uh, a roadmap for a hard-to-abate sector, the case for aluminium. My name is Miles Prosser, and I'm the Secretary General of the International Aluminium Institute. We're the global body for the aluminium industry. Uh, we have members that are involved in the upstream aluminium supply chain. We're a genuinely global organisation. We have producers of bauxite, alumina and aluminium in all the major producing regions of the world. Uh, as an organisation, we've existed for about 50 years. And during that 50 years, we've always had a focus on environmental and sustainability issues, and particularly on the collection and presentation of data. So this session is obviously looking at the aluminium sector. Um, it is one of the hard to abate sectors, the one often sort of referred to hard to abate sectors. Um, that's both a blessing and a curse. Uh, it's a curse because of course the hard to abate bit is not just a set of words, but is a sector where it is genuinely hard to abate emissions. Uh, a blessing because by at least being referred to as a hard to abate sector, it attracts a plenty of attention and interest in what we can do to reduce those emissions. So to provide a bit of context, the aluminium industry is responsible today for about 1.1 billion tonnes per year of CO2 equivalent emissions. That's about 2% of global emissions. Um, to put that in some sort of context, that's a, a sizable amount less than uh, materials like steel and cement, but obviously still a significant amount of emissions uh, to justify serious attention into how they're reduced. Of those 1.1 billion tonnes of emissions, about 70% or 700 million tonnes are related to the use of electricity. So aluminium is an electricity intensive material and depending on how that electricity is generated, that can either be a carbon free or a carbon intensive part of the process. Um, aluminium requires firm, consistent, continuous electricity. And so the options that have been used uh, historically have included hydro, coal, gas, and to some small extent, nuclear. One of the major challenges that faces the industry is how you decarbonise that electricity supply, but still maintain the continuous and firm nature that's required. So with this panel, we've decided to take a slightly different approach to what we've done on some other occasions. Uh, we've got five panellists who I will introduce as we work through the questions. But of those five panellists, only one of them is an aluminium producer. So what we've particularly tried to do in this session is to bring in perspectives from other people associated with the aluminium industry and particularly organisations who will be involved in collaborative work to reduce emissions in the aluminium industry. So we've got representatives of aluminium customers, we've got a representative of the investment community and we've got a representative of um, stakeholders and NGOs who work to try and foster that collaboration. And that'll give us a chance in the discussion to talk about the sort of collaboration that's needed and also to talk about the scale and speed of action that's required. So just some quick introductory words about aluminium. One of the main features about aluminium is that it will be crucial in reducing emissions in other parts of the economy. And that itself will drive an increase in demand for aluminium in coming years in a carbon constrained world. So for example, aluminium is a critical part of the transition from combustion engines to electric vehicles, and we'll cover some of that later on. Aluminium is used extensively in investment in renewable energy, the obvious example being the aluminium used in solar panels, but probably more significantly, the aluminium used in the distribution and transmission of electricity to customers. Um, aluminium is an infinitely recyclable food and drink packaging material, and one that can be used to reduce waste and create a circular economy. And finally, aluminium has a role to play in, the, in, in new building systems, which are both efficient and low maintenance and highly recyclable after use. So that's a good time for me to bring in the first of our panelists. I'll introduce them one at a time as we go along. So our first panelist on the left is uh, Niels Engel from BMW Group, and he's the project leader for the Katina X project. So Niels, BMW is an iconic brand in the motor vehicle market, but can you tell us a bit about what changes you're seeing in the choice of materials in the motor vehicle market and particularly in the issues that drive those decisions? Thank you, Miles. Yeah, as Miles uh, said, the car industry is moving towards electrification at a pretty fast pace. Uh, companies bringing out, we are bringing out a lot of electric cars in the next few years. 
We're expecting them to be the major product. And the car industry sees this product as a part of the solution for decarbonization because they decarbonize the use phase of the cars if you run them with green energy. But the production phase now is coming into focus because production of uh, electric cars takes in a lot of energy, produces a lot of carbon nowadays because first of the batteries, the um, high voltage uh, batteries take in a lot of energy to make them in the, uh, in the process of making the chemistry for them, uh, mining the materials for it. I think you all know that topic. But also they make the cars heavier and to counter that we're using more aluminium. There's also a lot of aluminium in the batteries itself, but also in other parts of the cars to take weight out. This is important for efficiency reasons, but also it's an engineering challenge to make he very heavy cars. You need to take the weight out for that reason as well. So it's crucial that um, we get green aluminium um, and decarbonized aluminium in the supply chain, um, because otherwise the footprint of the cars is going up and up. And this is just what BMW and other companies ha have set out to do. Um, they have set out first to bring transparency into their supply chain to understand where the emissions are and what are the different efficiencies of various actors in the supply chain. This is what Catena X is doing, bringing transparency to that space, but also implementing measures to bring down the carbon footprint of hydrogen. And um, we need partners to do that. And one of the solutions is to have more recycling to bring in uh, to, to close the loop, to bring in recycled secondary material, because the, this is a lot more energy efficient. And the second one is to smelt the aluminium from, with green energy from renewable sources. Thanks, Niels. Um, so aluminium brings some benefits there in terms of its light weight, in terms of, of the vehicle in use. But obviously that then also creates an obligation on aluminium to try and produce its material in as low a carbon way as possible. Um, I'll turn to our second panellist. Uh, Roland Hunziker is the Director of Built Environment for the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Roland, you're dealing in a different market, the building market. Are you seeing similar discussions occurring there? Are there different issues that take priority? And I imagine it could be a more complex discussion that's occurring there as well. Thank you very much. That works. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here as well. Um, in WBCSD, we have indeed a program on built environment transformation where we work with companies all along the value chain on how we, do we decarbonize the sector, but also how do we make it more circular. And just to take a step back, the built environment in its totality is 40% of global CO2 emissions. It's an easy to remember number. Um, but we haven't looked at this full number for quite a long time. Similar to the automotive industry, we had a strong focus on energy efficiency in buildings because it's the energy use that is about 70% of those emissions, 10 gigatons a year. But the material emissions that go into construction are 4 gigatons. This week, the Global Status Report for Buildings was issued by the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, and we've seen that emissions have again gone up in the sector. There was a short decline during the pandemic, but unfortunately we are above the peak of 2019 uh, now. So that means we really need to focus on all emissions in the built environment. So we call that whole life carbon. And we've done a lot of work uh, in WBCSD with our members to identify what do we mean with whole life carbon. We have a framework in which we clearly identify all emissions along the life cycle. So from Typically, we talk about the construction phase, the use phase, and then end of life. And we also talk about what goes into structure, into facade, into equipment, etc. And only if we understand all that can we really reduce to net zero over time. Now, where does aluminum come in? Aluminum, in the case studies we did, it's a bit skewed to the office sector, commercial market, but it was about 10% of those upfront emissions. So it's not as high as cement, concrete, steel but it is still in the top seven materials for the built environment. And as we are starting to look at how do we reduce those upfront emissions, obviously we need to take a, whole, a holistic approach. And that means we have to look at using materials differently through better design choices. So we're looking at 
stripping out a lot of things of buildings that we may not need from a carbon perspective. And it actually has savings as well. And then obviously the other part is how do we, the materials we need, how can they decarbonize? So that's the story of the built environment here and maybe we can go into more details later. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Um, so what I might do now is just spend a minute or so describing a little bit about the emissions of the aluminium industry and the sort of trajectory that needs to be taken to meet global climate change targets. So just a reminder, we're talking about an industry with a current emissions of about 1.1 million tonnes, 1.1 billion tonnes of CO2 equivalent, or about 2% of global emissions. So our organisation, the International Aluminium Institute, we undertook a study to develop the pathways that the industry would need to take in order to meet global climate change targets, particularly the 1.5 degree target, but also net zero. So to do that, we combined the International Energy Agency's economy-wide modelling with our own detailed data on industry emissions. So we came up with two scenarios, and they're consistent with the IAA scenarios of beyond two degrees and the 1.5 degree scenario. And we also developed a business as usual scenario. Now I think we've got a slide that we can pop up now. I'll see if we can get that to happen. So I'll describe it in words. So for the 1.5 degree scenario, what would be needed are reductions of 25% by 2030, 70% by 2035 and 95% by 2050. And all of that has to occur while demand and production are increasing. Sorry, it's the other slide, if you can pull that up. So if you can just think about that in your mind, a 25% reduction by 2030 and a 70% by 2035 says that a lot of that heavy lifting and emissions reductions will occur between 2030 and 2035. Now that's not the industry giving itself a holiday for five years. That reflects the fact that many of the technologies needed to reduce those emissions are not available for commercial deployment now. So there'll be a period of time to finalise the development of those technologies and then roll out the implementation. Some of the technologies are ready now. For example, zero carbon electricity is available in many jurisdictions but requires significant investment to roll it out. Some of the technologies are imminent, the inert anode technology that may be a few years away from commercial deployment, but also recycling technology around alloy sorting and alloy design. And some technologies will require more research and development before they're commercially available, particularly around industrial high temperature heat and electrification of those processes. So that sort of change in investment that needs to happen is a good time for me to bring in our next panellist, who is Mike Hemsley, from the, who's the Deputy Director from the Energy Transitions Commission. Mike, we're talking about some pretty big reductions here in emissions for the aluminium industry, and with that comes a pretty significant investment price tag. The Mission Possible Partnership work on the aluminium decarbonisation strategy looked at this. What does it mean in terms of investment, and particularly investment in those energy and electricity systems? Thanks, Miles. So, so yeah, at the ETC, we work closely with the Mission Possible Partnership, where, where we look at these so-called hard-to-abate sectors and try and understand how can they get to net zero and what's the pathway to net zero look like. And we've done something recently called sector transition strategies for all of the seven so-called hard-to-abate sectors, not just aluminium, but things like steel, but also aviation, shipping, th things like that. Uh, and what the aluminium one says is that um, if, if we don't get things right, if, if we don't decarbonize, aluminium might take up 37 gigatons of cumulative emissions between now and 2050. And that's about 10% of the remaining carbon budget for one and a half degrees. But actually, if we, we think we can decarbonize it at fairly low cost, and that could mean cumulative emissions could be 15 gigatons, so less than half the, the other projection, um, and getting towards net zero in 2050, which is quite an exciting opportunity, I think. You, you rightly highlighted earlier that most of the emissions associated with aluminium is from uh, electricity today, and obviously we can switch that to low-carbon electricity sources. Some of the other emissions are from the, the, uh, the anodes breaking down over time, and you mentioned in inert anodes can come in. They're at early technology re readiness level, but we think they can be commercialized. And across those two things, we think you can have full penetration of low carbon power by 2035 in the aluminium industry and start to introduce inert anodes from 2030. And those are the key milestones for the, for the sector. The third group of emissions then is decarbonizing the refining of the bauxite. Um, and that again need, needs, to, needs to be de decarbonized overall. But we do think it's possible. Investment is, is a big part of this. When we look at investment, we think it's about a trillion dollars cumulatively over that period. And when we look at actually all the hard to abate sectors, it's slightly surprising, but almost all of the investment, about 70% in the case of aluminium, is building low carbon electricity. 
much of which is building, re building renewables. And that's the case across all sectors. For aluminium, it's direct uh, low carbon electricity. For things like steel, it's building renewables to make low green hydrogen to put into to steel plant as well. So that's a massive in, in investment challenge overall. But, but fun fundamentally, you know, we, we know we can scale low carbon electricity globally. It, it should be no different for the aluminium sector, really. And uh, that trillion dollar number is one we'll return to in a minute or so, I think, because it, it, it does tend to draw the mind and the attention. Um, our next, pe next panellist is Ivano Ianelli, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer for Emirates Global Aluminium. So Ivano is our token aluminium producer on the panel. So Ivano, you face these challenges as an aluminium producer in a country, the UAE, which historically has relied on gas for electricity supply. Can you describe as a company how you go about the task ahead of you and what actions you've already commenced? Thank you, Miles. And uh, again, I feel the pressure right now, being the only plant on the panel. But um, just uh, in a quick word, and again, I've been saying it quite enough at this COP, it's all about commercial resilience. We, we do not want to uh, look the other way. We do see that our stakeholders, our partners are looking for a different kind of product. And EGA is focused on premium aluminium and wishes to align to the desire of the stakeholders around us. So the world is changing. They're asking for uh, a better class. And it's true. We do have a lot of natural gas. We, uh, we just installed uh, uh, a couple of years back uh, uh, the highest efficiency uh, gas turbine with 63% uh, efficiency. Uh, yet this is not where we're heading. We are moving to renewables. We're looking into uh, clean energy. We're looking at capturing whatever is left uh, and not even uh, uh, storing it. Uh, partnering with other stakeholders in the manufacturing of sustainable aviation fuels uh, or uh, green methanol, so to say. So it's all about creating the synergies with, uh, uh, with the other stakeholders, with our uh, partners. Uh, we are blessed because, for example, uh, one of uh, EGA plants is uh, in Tawila, and it's one of the hydrogen valleys. So right next to us, we have uh, uh, the ability uh, to tap into a 300,000 tons green hydrogen facility. And uh, just by taking the CO2 from our power plant and uh, providing it to them, which literally is across our boundary, uh, we're able to uh, um, allow the UAE to manufacture uh, a new class of product. So for us, it's just ma making sure that uh, uh, we look at the opportunities that are within our grasp and we'll uh, provide uh, commercial uh, uh, readiness for it. Thanks, Ivano. Um, and that sort of touching on that idea of um, being able to tap into the hydrogen economy brings us to the issue of collaboration. So Mike, I might just go back to you for a second. Your, the Mission Possible Partnership work and the Energy Transition Commission's work is a lot about the collaboration that's needed to bring about these investments. Can you talk about what actions there are that need to mobilise that level of investment we're talking about, and particularly the respective roles of investors and governments and customers? Sure, yeah. And, um, so so what, what we do at the Mission Possible Partnership and, and what we think is very useful is you know, agreeing what the vision is for each of these sectors. And you get industry buy into that vision, but you also use that to take to governments and investors and, and make clear that this is the vision for that sector. And, we, and we're also doing that with things like GFANS, the Glasgow, Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, being like, these are the pathways for these sectors and the science-based target initiative as well. So that, that's kind of the first bit of collaboration, which is quite useful. I think the next bit is making the business case for these, in, these investments over Rule. And I think government can definitely help create a supporting env em environment here. I think there's, there's some things, particularly the focus around low carbon electricity, where go government things like uh, creating business cases for renewables can be very important, but not just renewables, you know, the, the flexibility on the grid and, e and even kind of the rules around take, um, off taking for the grid so that it doesn't penalize the fact that aluminium needs to use firm power, uh, but it may only need that firm power for some of the time when, say, dedicated renewables are, are, not, are not being used. So, so that's an important part overall. Um, other parts are more in kind of R&D support or help with commercialization for things like the inert anodes you mentioned or in, indeed in refining technologies. Again, government support can be quite useful there. Uh, but moving away from government, what we find is also quite important is um, procurement. 
and, and I think what's exciting in all of the hard to abate sectors and things like the First Movers Coalition, which is pairing you know, low carbon suppliers of materials with lo people who want to buy those low carbon materials, you start to see that you, you can have these supplier buyer agreements to drive the, the lo low carbon investments in these industries. And that, that's, that's quite exciting. In some of these hard to abate industries, including in aluminium, we do think there will be what we call a green premium of doing the low carbon thing, which will add to overall product costs. But that does, when you pass that through to the end consumer, that doesn't necessarily have to be that material. I was looking at the numbers this morning, I think it's around $400 per ton of aluminium is the green premium we think so. But if you pass that through to a Coke can, it's one cent on a Coke can. And you think that would, that, that's very manageable. Obviously, if you pass that through to a grid or much larger volumes of aluminum, it will be more expensive. But you can start to understand that you know, even though it's a cost at the site level, if you get the value chain collaboration right, if you agree you know, who, who's passing on what type of cost, you can probably pass through some of this to con consumers as a means to scaling it up as well. And I think having those pieces in place also allows investors to see, you know, we can put money into this, we know it's low risk, we've got the offtake agreements, things like that, and that can help with the returns as well. Thanks, Mike. Um, and lastly, but certainly not leastly, our trillion dollar panelist is Kelly Constabile, from the, who's the Managing Director and the Global Head of Sustainability Strategy and Net Zero from Standard and Chartered. But Kerry also brings a view to this discussion from the Rocky Mountain Institute's Climate Aligned Finance Working Group, which she is part of. So Kerry, we've touched on investment a number of times, not surprisingly. You come to these issues from an investment perspective. Is the sort of scale of investment we're talking about, this trillion dollars by 2050, is that achievable, particularly given that presumably other sectors face a similar investment challenge? And perhaps also you can touch a bit on that, the, the issues that Mike raised around the respective roles of governments and customers and investors in that process. Thanks, Miles. Um, so in terms of whether it's achievable theoretically yes yes it's it, you know we can we can all get there i think the what, i think what we're seeing and particularly at cop right now is that we are nowhere near what is needed right we're, we're seeing you know, there's there are a lot of announcements in the billions that's great it's, it's a drop in the water right i mean a drop in the bucket rather so yes it's achievable theoretically but we have a lot, a lot of work to do, and we are far, far from being there. I think you know, Mike pointed to a few, a few really important things. I, I'd like to, I mean, just touch on governments and then the regional focus and standardization. In terms of government collaboration, I mean, as as we've discussed, you know, the the over 60% of of decarbonizing the aluminum sector is dependent on renewable energy and shifting shifting the grid. But not only shifting the grid, you know, just on an intermittent basis, but really firm power, etc. And that is going to require a revamping and an upgrading of transmission lines. And that, and, and that requires government investment. And so you know, there, there is a significant role for private capital, but governments need to come in and de-risk and you know for that indirect emission element of aluminum production. So that's, that's quite important. I think in addition, I mean, it, what we need to look at is the regional focus. So we have, you know, in, in terms of globally, where is aluminum produced? And the majority of production is in China. China is doing a, a, a incredible job in terms of upgrading its transmission um, and and investing in ultra high voltage. You know, and that you know that is extremely important to actually decarbonize the the industry. Uh, we need China at the table, and so you know, in these discussions, whether it's at COP, whether it, you know, when it, when we're actually, you know, working on um, these industry initiatives, etc., China really, you know, Chinese banks, industry need to be at the table so that we can, we can learn from them in terms of the UHV investments and also, and also leverage, um, leverage one another's, you know, expertise in R D and D. And the third element, and this is related to Standard Chartered's work with Rocky Mountain Institute, is standardization. And so, uh, we, I mean, we all are incredibly aware of the lack of standardization in defining low carbon, hard to abate sectors, low carbon pathways, low carbon products, investment vehicles, etc., is is leading to one a lot of confusion in the market, two, real greenwashing. And, and so that is why we are working together with banks and industry players 
to, com uh, to devise a common definition and standardization for what carbon-free, low-carbon low aluminum looks like, both from an indirect and a direct emissions perspective. And that, that is critical. To get this right at scale, we need a common definition. Kerry, uh, and we'll come back to the, certainly those points about standardisation later on. Um, Roland, we've heard about collaboration from the investment end, but it's also going to be important to have collaboration in the use phase. Um, so coming from the perspective of the building sector, what sort of changes do you think are needed in how the supply chain works together for the built environment? And particularly, are there issues around product design and recycling? There are many issues indeed, uh, as also the other panellists have identified. The challenge with the built environment is its fragmentation. So we have so many players involved from material extraction to construction, those who design buildings, those who develop the real estate, those who finance that and ultimately the end user. And a lot of things go wrong along that chain. We're not aligned. And cost was uh, mentioned before. So even if a designer may put in low carbon options, it could get costed out later on by someone else. And so similar to the standardization discussion that Kerry has mentioned, it is critical that we focus on that whole life carbon approach and that we really standardize what we mean by that. We had encouraging discussions here at the COP. Even ISO has now come out with a net zero standard. SPTI obviously is also working on that for the building sector. So there is, there is a lot of work happening, um, but we need to land that in the next couple of years so that we really all can work together. And an example of collaboration is, I think we have uh, Norsk Hydro here in the room as well. They're working with Velux. Velux are a window manufacturer. And for them, aluminum is fundamental. It's their scope three. And for Norsk Hydro, it's your scope one and two. And so we really see that collaboration that needs to happen so that Velux can reduce its emissions, still have great windows <laughs> and, and frames. And so it, it needs that collaboration. And you're also mentioning the the circularity aspect and resource efficiency aspect, um, that will be fundamental. Um, I think we're st we still have some way to go in the circularity discussion. Um, but again, if we look at a building and all its components, we can break that down and we have to break it down because different elements have different lifespans in a building. And so we can't just put it all into one pot. We need to look at the structure, at the facade, and those different lifetimes. But then we can um, look at new business models, how we can develop that. And again, to focus on that, we need to look at the whole life carbon impacts, because if we put at the beginning stuff that may be very low upfront in terms of carbon, but it needs a lot of replacement, then we're not winning the game. So I think there's a lot of aspects to consider. And that's also something um, we're doing with our members at the WBCSD is how do we define circularity in buildings? How do we measure it? And then helping everyone along the chain to, to develop these new business models. And again, fundamentally, working with the real estate and the investor community because the alignment has to come from the demand side because a lot of things can get stripped out on the way. So unless there is a clear focus on carbon from those who um, initiate projects and finance them, then it will be harder to achieve. So hopefully that gives us a few reflections on that collaboration element. Yeah, thanks, Roland. That's terrific. Um, it always strikes me that when we look at recycling in the aluminium industry, the real success story is recycling aluminium drink cans. But they're assisted by the fact that it goes on the shelf, it gets used, and it's available for recycling literally within days. When we talk about the built environment, we're talking about aluminium that goes into use and could sit there for decades before it then becomes available. So changes we make now in the built environment may only impact on secondary aluminium many decades down the track. Um, Niels, you've got similar challenges there in the automotive industry, albeit the material comes back a bit quicker, maybe 10 to 15 years for an automotive life. But are you seeing changes in the way that the motor vehicle sector works along the value chain? Are there more questions being asked up the value chain? Is there more collaboration occurring in terms of vehicle design and what you expect of suppliers? Yeah, quite a few things have been, been touched. Off-take agreements, we have been, um, been, been doing that with the EGA, um, for example, to, and, and doing that in, for, in some other industries as well, but for aluminium it's, it's an important tool. Um, to give 
some security about, about investments and that it finds customers. I think if you can do that upfront more often, uh, we're going to get investment uh, in low carbon materials. So this is one, one tool. And the other one which was mentioned was transparency and standardization. We're actually working on a, on a standard for, for carbon accounting because this is also something we want to put in our fin uh, financial reporting. So I think once companies do that, they get, get it on the same level than their, their financial results. And um, they need to be a standard to do that and um, a verification and auditing standard. Um, but it's important that we, we put it up there together with the, with the financial results, then we're going to get the pressure on it to do more of what we just described. And lastly, yes, we're working at Catena X, this is my project, together with uh, many actors, we're more than 120 companies now, um, with the value chain to get information uh, standards, but also information about carbon emissions over the value chain to identify where do we have to act um, where is process efficiency high? Where can we benchmark with others where it's not so high? Um, Ivano, you're back to you as the aluminium supplier. You're fielding all these questions and requests for information. Are you having to do more as a supplier in terms of what you supply? Not just a physical product, but also information about that product. And are you seeing more collaboration along the value chain? I see a lot more confusion along the value chain but a lot more, because all of the sudden I have uh, all these standards, all these reporting mechanisms, and they all have a different number. And my biggest threat is how do I justify to Niels that my report to him says X, the one to the CBAM authority says Y, and another one might say completely different number. So l there is a lot of education coming on, on board, and again, the standardization component is quite tricky. That accuracy is uh, uh, keeping me awake at night because, as I was just telling someone earlier today, we still work on Excels. I cannot get a validator to come in and get the numbers of SAP because there isn't a platform available. All this that we're doing today, it's all new. CBAM didn't exist. ETS was there. But all of a sudden, we have this reporting mechanism coming online, asking companies to change, to improve, to report. Uh, and the opportunity here is to, as you said, create these partnerships to create collaborative environments going forward. And the ability for us to report, to find this uh, standard mechanism. Uh, at the moment, even though we are looking at scope three emission as an, as an example, the focus for us is to create uh, uh, carbon clubs, so to say, so that we decarbonize each other scope three emissions. So essentially, the work that EGA does today should be trivial to uh, entities like uh, BMW decarbonizing their uh, uh, materials, but also to me, whatever I have upstream should be decarbonizing over time. So for us, it's all uh, uh, creating this standardization that we've been talking about, which in reality is a lot more complex than might actually seem. I know. Um, just uh, on notice for the audience, we'll take some questions from the floor in a minute. So if you've got anything you'd like to ask any of the panelists, please be ready. Um, before we do that, I'm just going to touch back to an issue that's been raised a few times, which is about standardisation and consistency of carbon footprint. I might do a run along the panel from left to right and just ask each of you to make a comment about, I think we can accept that we're all going to say it's important, um, but how do we go about getting that level of consistency and transparency? What's, the, what's missing now? Is it up to the suppliers to do it, the customers, a regulator? How do we get to that point? Niels? I think and this is what we're trying to do. We have to do it as an industry. We shouldn't wait for the regulators that might turn out in whatever direction. We need to come together and define standards and also use technology digitization to do that over the value chain because you cannot do that with Excel. That, that will be, I, I'm aware that we're doing it like that today, but we need to link up the, the value chain on a platform. It should be open source, should be open to everybody. Um, but with common data models, with common standards. And this is what we're working on, actually together with uh, WBCSD as well and the Rocky Mountains Institute. So we w I would invite everybody to, to come together to do that. I mean, to your question of who should be involved, it's, it's, 
every every aspect of the industry and that's that's where i think i think mike was referencing the life cycle assessments saying that 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 we need banks we need industry players we need every, and we need from every region and and you know and china's an important player so i mean that is that's quite important i would say in addition i mean there there are a lot of digital tools that we can we can deploy and learn from uh, you know that um, you know, geo informed tools and so i think it's whatever cloud product we want to use or or multiple clouds or etc i think that's what's quite important is to overlay the multiple data data sources so that we have complete full transparency in in the supply chain flows in in also the renewable energy um, sourcing and then also for the direct emissions some of the geologic um, storage options for potential CCS or green hydrogen you know so that we can tackle both you know we can have a standard standardization for indirect and direct emissions and we can also have a standardization in terms of in terms of really monitoring the opportunities for efficiencies and and transparency I'm uh, not as positive as my colleagues here. <laughs> I actually see a more cynical side of uh, reporting, which uh, mirrors the tax regime. So every country, every jurisdiction will have its own requirements. And again, funny enough, uh, uh, the biggest collaboration I have within EGA working on uh, uh, these changes to legislative environments comes from the group Treasury and Tax because I will have most likely uh, a reporting mechanism associated to every uh, destination, every jurisdiction. So even though there will be some degree of standardization, uh, it will not be a one-fits-all uh, uh, type regime. Yeah, I think it, it sounds a bit worrying, actually. I think you, you see this in, uh, across the hard to abate industries and that there are some of these deals going ahead without the standards, but you do need to get the standards right, otherwise it's going to hold things back. And I, I, I don't, to be honest, I don't know too much about aluminium standards, but it does sound like there's quite a few brewing and we really need to kind of focus on the one or two which we think are going to be implemented and, and push those ones forward. The glass is always half empty and half full. The good thing in the built environment, we can build on existing schemes. So environmental product declarations are clearly to build on. So I'm sure you have those, but in markets where we're not doing, we're, we're not doing them yet, this will come very quickly. But indeed, then we need to, the, 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 they just sit on a, they should just sit somewhere. They're not being used in decision making. So the, the big change that needs to happen, and indeed we're only at the beginning, is in order to get to a net zero built environment, we need to have standardization on how we measure that. And we're working with several organizations on how we uh, standardize that. And I'd like to give a shout out to a global engineering firm, Arup. Last year at the COP, they committed to do whole life carbon assessments on all their projects. And this year, again at the COP, um, they gave an update on their progress. And so they have created their own database with 1,000 projects in there with all the whole life carbon data. And they're open to collaborate with the others in the industry to create really a framework that we can all agree on. And we're also working with the International Code Council, with RICS um, and others. And yesterday ISO was there as well. So that I think we need that standardization of the language because then when somebody says, oh, I'm 400 kilograms of embedded CO2 and I'm 450, that they're actually the same because today you can make those claims as you want. So I, I'm, I think the glass is half full because the next two years will, 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 will bring a lot of standardization here. I hope. Thanks. Thanks, Roland. Um, and I'm going to do a short advertisement for our own organisation here. We've actually um, been the custodians, if you like, of the standard methodology for calculating the carbon footprint of aluminium. We've recently updated that to reflect the sort of demands of, of the marketplace, and it now covers scope one, scope two, and up, upstream scope three. But going to Ivano's point, it's about getting other people to agree to use that methodology is one of the, the, the challenges that's out there. So I did say that we'd have a chance for questions from the audience, so I'm going to hand up straight away. If I can ask you to just briefly say who you are and where you're from before you ask the question. Good afternoon. Uh, Stan Chen from RecycleGo in the, in the US. We are a blockchain for recycling. Uh, my question is to all, all the distinguished speakers here. So given the nature of COP uh, in terms of developing 
uh, nations and indigenous populations. How do you see, like, you know, I understand the scope one, two, and three, like, you know, uh, standards that you've implemented to reduce your carbon impact. But how do you see your role in terms of getting climate financing, uh, the industry from resource rich countries, um, develop, uh, developed countries to these developing nations in terms of their climate needs? I mean, I'm, ha I'm happy to, to start. I mean, Standard Chartered is, a, is you know, m the majority of our, our footprint is in emerging markets. Um, and so, so we, are, we are consistently, our, 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 our focus is getting climate finance to, to emerging markets. I mean, I think you know, that said, if, if you're referring to loss and damage, I mean, that is, that is a, a different type of transaction. Um, and that is a, you know, that is more with respect to community level investments. And, and so I think, you know, what, you know, there, there are multiple different types of investments that we need to, to bond, one, fund the adaptation uh, you know, crisis, <laughs> um, one, fund mitigation, and, and also address loss and damage. I think Standard Chartered, from our, from our focus, has been primarily mitigation finance, as has the majority of the finance community. And that's, that's largely because it's, it's, those are... Um, those, those have been easier projects to to fund, and and pro, you know there has been less of, less work done on taxonomy for adaptation finance, etc. So that's a lot of what we're seeing at this COP is to is to change that, and um, as we as a bank are extremely supportive of that change and increasing our investment in adaptation, um, and then exploring how how from a from a private finance side we can we can contribute to the loss and damage um, investment at community level. Yeah, sorry, I will not address the aluminum question, but maybe uh, others want to do that. From a built environment perspective, obviously there is a huge burden on the built environment. We're, st we're speaking here on decarbonization, but we also need to build millions of homes for people that are affordable and resilient. So many of the companies that work with us, they're, they're active in emerging markets as well. And they're looking at what are the solutions for more affordable homes but that are also low carbon and how do we start implementing circularity because there is a huge um, opportunity as well for local de development through more circular solutions. If we create material marketplaces, we don't waste things anymore. We have less landfills and that is actually valorized. So, but I fully agree with, so just from the built environment perspective, there's a huge burden to better understand that and how do we serve those markets. And there is a lot of innovation also around how to create these uh, affordable housing. Yeah, I, I think you touch on a very important theme from, from this COP. And I think there's a risk that we're seeing the clean energy transition and investment in the clean energy transition um, outside of emerging markets only. And, and part of that, including the case for aluminium, is um, because you can have a higher cost of capital in emerging and, and developing economies. The, a lot of decarbonizing aluminium is building low carbon electricity. We know that's capital intensive. So there's a risk that this exacerbates the problem overall. When people look at how to, how to address these things, they say, well, it's the right type of money for the right type of project. And in some cases, that means concessional lending rates from the act actors like the World Bank, other multilateral development banks, or the IMF to try and help this stuff. I think everybody's agreed that they're not doing enough in that space, but I think that has to be part of the solution, um, including for low carbon aluminium, if we are going to put it into uh, emerging markets as well. <clears throat> Thanks. Is it on? Okay, can you hear me? No. no. Okay, th thanks a lot. Uh, my name is John Cornwall Bank from Store so uh, renewable materials company. Uh, with a lot of private forest. Um, I, my question is uh, primarily to Mike, I think, from uh, the Energy Transitions Commission, uh, related to electricity. Um, when we're also looking to maybe capture some of all the biogenic carbon we have, because you need molecules for parts of the, um, the economy, even when it's a climate-resilient economy, 
I think our biggest stumbling stone in our scenarios when we look 15 years ahead for depreciation of any project in that matter is actually availability of green electricity, but also especially the price of green electricity. It's just in the way we, we look at the scenarios, it's simply too expensive. Um, and I was, I was curious about your thinking uh, on that. Uh, what does it do to your case? Is there enough green electrons? Are they too expensive? Uh, uh, if it's only market, uh, the market will, of course, allocate the electrons to the ones that can pay the most. But do you see that policy intervention is needed to distribute the electrons into where the societal value add of the products are the largest? Great question. Thanks. So, so yeah, we, my my organisation uh, loves green electricity, and and we think you know that overall green ele green electricity should be 60% of overall energy by 2050, and and actually. Yeah. We don't see any fundamental barrier to scaling green electricity. We do think it's cheap, and we think it's getting cheaper. You know, one of the members of our organization, AquaPower, I think holds the record for uh, the cheapest electricity generated from solar, which is $10 per megawatt hour in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and for context, I pay 50 pounds per megawatt hour for wholesale electricity in a normal year in the UK. This year, I'm probably paying 200. So it is, it's 5% of that. It, it's, it's really, really cheap electricity. And, and we think, you know, this, this can be true in many areas of the world, either for solar or for wind. Um, and we could, we, there's no barrier to scaling up in terms of land availability, material availability, thing, things like that. Th things that one, one thing we're worried about on the electricity side is, can you get the planning and permitting right to scale it up fast enough? And I think that, yeah, and, and th that's an issue as well. The distribution networks and the planning for that is, is also an issue. I think another challenge for the aluminium industry, unlike other industries, is the need for firm power which does add additional cost as well. But again, uh, to cite Aqua Power, who I heard talking about this the other day, they say they could deliver a re renewable electricity project in Africa for three do uh, $30 per megawatt hour, and it would be $40 per megawatt hour if they threw a battery in there as well. So you know, these, these kind of low costs are also possible with that as well. I think another option is dedicated renewable electricity with a grid connection to top up when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. And, it, and again, I think it's a bit more of a challenge in the aluminium sector, but fundamentally I think green electricity can be the, the way to decarbonize overall. I'm going to get Ivano to make a comment on this only because I know his company has made a, a significant move in recent years <laughs> to using more green energy. Ivano, do you want to talk a bit about... Well, at the moment, uh, renewables is the cheapest source of power. So there isn't, uh, in our case, is uh, uh, building them fast enough so that we can sign the PPAs. So as he said, uh, renewables are currently uh, very price competitive. Uh, the largest barrier we have is adapting the battery storage or any sort of storage together with renewables so that we have uh, more of it. But if you take a smelter the size of EGA, uh, we're looking in uh, uh, 40 plus terawatt hours a year of energy. Whereas uh, even though the UAE has just committed to scale up by 2030 with 30 gigs of solar, it's still be taking most of this uh, capacity on, uh, onto itself. Stefan Krinke, uh, VW Group, uh, Head of Sustainability Strategy and Decarbonization. Uh, my question goes to VBCSD and to my colleague from BMW. Um, currently, Volkswagen is implementing decarbonization measures in the supply chain, and I think BMW does the same. But the reality is, if we go to our suppliers, CO2 values are not comparable, are not comparable. And this is the problem because we don't want to wait and we cannot afford to wait for initiatives in standardization which take years because we decide, and BMW does the same, we decide about now, the next decades. And therefore my question to, to both of you is how can we support that all those standardization issues become a real high-speed process and not a process where we have to wait for years? because decisions must be taken right now and CO2 values must be 100% comparable. We cannot afford any longer discussion about that. I, I can go first. I mean, I, I don't think we need to wait for that full standardization. It's true, it's not perfect. Um, some people say that 
in the building sector, whole life carbon assessments can vary 30% depending on the methodology you use. That's not the end of the world. So I think to your point, we need to maybe live with those uncertainties and as much as possible come together and speed up the work we do on, on, on that harmonization. Now, I can't give you a, a number how many years that takes depending on the sector. Maybe you have a better idea for, uh, for the automotive. Um, so I think much of it also is we have to be much more transparent. So if you open up and say, look, this is how we do it, and, and other companies as well, we have slightly different numbers, but why is that? So I think we see more of that openness and, and that helps us hopefully reduce those ranges as we're working on the standardization. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> we at, at Catena X, um, we, we have written now a, a first draft for standard and are about to send it out. Um, just standardizing it inside Catena X at the moment with the 120 plus companies. Um, and want to make a contribution for that. And Volkswagen has been instrumental in, in bringing that about. And so I think, yeah, we, we need to speed up that process and but also do it a bit ourselves and kind of push the, the standardization bodies a bit by kind of providing a draft. But it will take some time. I'm also aware of involving, let's say, all the world regions. But we are pushing very hard for that. And I think it's, a, it's important if you really want to um, cascade carbon um, values over the value chain and measure real process emissions over the value chain because especially automotive is so complex, touches so many industries that it's a huge need to to have a, a methodology which brings the various industries involved together and make them comparable. Because also important, um, if you want to make engineering decisions based on aluminium or steel or plastics maybe, um, how to do, wh what materials to use in the cars, it's important that we can compare these values. Yeah, I'd certainly echo that point. It is as important how you compare different materials as much as how you compare different suppliers of the same material. So that's great to hear. I'm going to throw to one last question before I'm then going to go to the panel to do some um, summarising. Sorry for other questions. You might just want to grab the panellists at the end. So. Hi, um, I'm Jeremy Gregory from the MIT Climate and Sustainability Consortium. And um, we heard a lot about the importance of uh, investments and working across value chains. I wonder if anyone in the panel could talk about instances where an aluminum producer either is making an investment in decarbonization technologies or is planning to based on either commitments from value chain or their, their customers or um, actual financial uh, collaborations on some of those decarbonization uh, technologies. So. <laughs> well, um, I can start. Let's take a little piece of legislation, which uh, just is uh, keeping me uh, busy these days, which is called the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. So now I have to, uh, let's say, pay a fee for the embodied carbon of uh, the aluminum imported into uh, the EU. From an investment standpoint, I could simply just write a check to the EU, and again, I'm Italian, it would probably trickle down to my country, or uh, uh, I could actually look at it from uh, uh, the investment opportunity itself. So I know that I will pay it for at least 10, 20, 30 years. I look at the value of that liability and I start decarbonizing today. And this is exactly what it's happening. So we, that's why EGA joined the first mover coalition in the first place, is to take all these art to abate uh, uh, technologies, uh, are these technologies that are trivial to the art to abate industries and fast track their uh, uh, readiness by using this, uh, uh, let's say, l forward looking methodology and uh, capturing the value within the country's own GDP. We just don't want this, uh, this cost, this liability to uh, filter out. To answer more directly, we have um, a contract with, with EGA to source aluminium from solar power smelting, and I think that has helped at least to bring about that investment. So I'm We're doing do it for other companies and in other regions as well. So I'm going to do the timekeeper thing and go to some summary comments. So what I'd like to do, and I'm going to work from my right to left, is ask each of the panellists to imagine themselves on this panel in a few years' time, or your equivalent on this panel in a few years' time. 
what sort of things are we going to be talking about that are different and what things will we have achieved that makes it clear that we're on track? So let's take ourselves five years into the future from today. So Roland, what do you think will be looking differently in five years' time? I think from a built environment perspective, we will see in more countries what is happening, for example, in Denmark that has taken whole life carbon benchmarks for the whole industry and that everybody needs to align around. So we will know exactly a new building, how much carbon can, can go into it. We know that by 2030, we need to halve the emissions. And I think we can do it in the, in the next five years. We don't know yet how to get to net zero, but we can absolutely reduce a half of the emissions. Well, I really hope we've agreed one of these standards and we're starting to use it. Um, and aside from that, I hope that there's a few more big aluminium projects which have proved the low carbon renewable electricity plus firm power value chain works for the aluminium sector. And we're starting to look at the other parts of emissions, including the anodes and the refining and starting to progress towards decarbonizing those as well. I actually want to go back in time. At the turn of the millennium, when uh, we were looking at solar uh, panels and uh, looking at $3 a watt and thinking how outrageous it was, we are now today having that same solar panel costing 15 to 18 cents. The same will happen with all these technologies that we're looking at today. And all we can do is, again, going back to partnerships, collaborate, do these pilots so that we fast track the uh, commercialization of technologies. So I, agree, I definitely hope that we get to w one standard. I think it's going. I think we have to expect that it's going to be a bumpy road to get there, right? So, so, but in five years' time, I expect that we will we will get there. In addition, I I expect that we will see a, a lot more industrial clusters for carbon-free aluminum. I think you know what Quebec is doing to produce close to hydropower um, and and have Alcoa and Rio Tinto there. Um, I think is is a good example of what needs to be scaled and I think we will see a lot more of that. I also think we're going to see a lot more of trade finance that's going to enable um, renewable energy, you know, transmission flows and also uh, the resilience of the recycling supply chain. So I think in five years we will we, we will see a sophisticated more sophisticated renew, you know, trade finance capacities to to enable those flows and and make it make it much more possible. I think we will see product carbon footprint information for products, for cars, and companies are going to compete with the, those values and that information. And that will put pressure on the value chain to bring down these emissions because it will be important for customer choice. Excellent. Thanks, Niels. Thanks, all the panelists. So um, that's the end of the panel session. Thanks very much for listening and engaging. Uh, I encourage you to continue to engage with the aluminium industry as we embark on what's going to be a very significant transformation of the industry over the next decade or so. Um, and also engage with the International Aluminium Institute through social media to track what the industry is doing. Can I just ask you now to give a round of applause to our panellists for the great contribution they've given. <laughs>